Uh, good evening. My name is Ashok Kamath. I am the secretary of the IIT Alumni Center in Bengaluru. And uh, welcome to our 24th webinar, something that we, an initiative that we began uh, in April. Uh, and we've had a webinar every weekend. Uh, these days, of course, we compete with the IPL, uh, especially on a Saturday when there are two games back on back. Uh, today's topic is very interesting. Uh, if you look at uh, the recent history of our elections in this country, uh, you would have seen uh, you know, terms like VVPAT and all the noise that people made around it uh, uh, you know, du you know, during the elections and way after. Uh, and you know, as we are witnessing today in the United States, uh, there is this big you know, issue about uh, voting uh, uh, for the presidential election uh, and lots of complaints about mail-in ballots and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, it should not surprise any one of us uh, on, who are watching this that we are far ahead of the United States when it comes to voting technologies and the implementation of those technologies in our voting system. Uh, we have used electronic voting machines in for, election, for all elections since the year 2004. And in some elections between 1998 and 2001, in a phased manner, we've been using it, right? In the last general election, 20,625 EVMs were put to use uh, uh, across the country. And, uh, you know, uh, the basic design uh, came from the Industrial Design Center at IIT Bombay. But, uh, you know, uh, a lot, most of the technology you will hear from the horse's mouth, as they say, from the, you know, Professor Rajat Muna, uh, whom I'll introduce in just a minute. Uh, Professor Muna did his uh, BTEC from IIT Kanpur and his PhD from the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, I was fascinated to know that his doctoral advisor was Professor V. Raja Raman. And for those of my vintage who did our first courses in uh, Fortran programming, that was the book that we used, uh, Professor Raja Raman's book. So, Professor Muna, you're very fortunate to have worked under a legendary uh, name. Uh, subsequently, uh, you know, uh, Professor Muna has been a faculty member at IIT Kanpur and now director at IIT Bhilai. But in between, he spent a few interesting years as Director General of CDAC, the Center for Development of Advanced Computing, and is probably the most recognized person when it comes to electronic toll collection and EVFs. Uh, moderating today uh, is uh, Professor Dinesh Sharma from IIT Bombay. Uh, Professor Sharma did his uh, MSc from Briggs Pilani and a PhD from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay and has been a visiting scientist uh, with Grenoble uh, in France and also with the Microelectronic Center in North Carolina. He has been at IIT Bombay since 1991. Uh, I, I'm sure he's now using the next generation IITs as well. He just came in from a meeting with IIT Jammu. So uh, we have him here. And finally, my colleague, Dr. Sushila Venkatraman, uh, I, my colleague at IIT ACB, she will wrap up at the end of the day. Uh, uh, for all viewers, uh, I'm sure you'll have questions and uh, we're looking for very interesting questions at that. Please do put them in the Q&A box only. The chat boxes are not being monitored for questions. Only the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens are being monitored for Q&A. So please uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll begin this presentation with Professor Muna talking for approximately half, uh, about 40 minutes or so, 40 minutes uh, or so, uh, at which point we'll take a break and take some questions, which will be moderated by Professor Sharma. And then Professor Muna will continue and we'll have another you know, iteration of that and uh, try and conclude by 6.30. Uh, you know, I think generally we, are, we do close at uh, 6.30. So with that, over to you, Professor Muna, and uh, we'll just go off video at this point. Your audio is mute. Uh, 
uh, I think I am audible now. Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Ashok, uh, for a very nice introduction, and I am very pleased to actually share this uh, stage with Professor Dinesh Sharma, uh, person whom I admire a lot for a very long time because for a number of reasons he work in the same area or similar area. He is very methodical and he is also my partner in this member of technical expert committee of EVM. So he is yet another member. Chairman of this technical expert committee is Professor D.T. Shahani of IIT Delhi. Um, this particular presentation, the way I have organized is I will first give a brief introduction uh, about the EVM and then I will talk about what so many controversies each election after election keep coming and what do people say and what do they mean and are there is there any truth or not and talk about some of that and after the break i will actually talk about the real technology and hold on to your breath because this is by and large the best technology available anywhere in the world so I will talk about you know why it is the best technology and how it has moved and all that. So let me first start uh, with the presentation. Uh, so in the election, Indian election, there are we need to understand there are two separate elections, one which are conducted by Election Commission of India, and another one which is conducted by individual state election commissions election commission of india the hierarchy is that there is a chief election commissioner and election commissioners the uh, three of them actually is the election commission and and with them there are several deputy election commissioners um, in each state it is controlled by what is known as chief election officer and then there is a machinery called uh, district election officer, electoral role officer, returning officer, block level officer, and so on and so forth. In a state election commission, a hierarchy exists in the similar way, but it is um, headed by state election commission or state election commissioners. And then below that, every state has its own methods. So, in election commission of India conducts elections for Lok Sabha various Vidhan Sabhas, presidential elections, vice president, and Rajya Sabha elections. Whereas state election commissions conduct elections for local body, mayors of the cities, Sabhasats, Panchayat, and all such local body elections are carried out by state election commissions. Um, to just uh, uh, summarize, on, there are two different kind of acts. Uh, the central body, the Election Commission of India, follows what is known as Representation of People's Act or RP Act 1951. Various other states actually have their own acts and they follow that. And therefore, it brings to this concept of two separate electoral roles, one which is in the custody of Election Commission of India, one which is in the State Election Commission, and the electorate is actually defined accordingly. There are separate kinds of voting systems. Some may use, in, I mean, most actually use EVMs, but even EVMs by state election commissions and EVMs by election commission of India are two separate EVMs. And not only that, even they are, when, whenever they are same, they actually follow different admin protocols. Sometimes the state election commissions don't even use EVMs and they have their own mechanism of sometimes even using ballot boxes so in this talk we are going to focus on the central elections now first a very quick recap of voting with evm and this will probably appreciate understanding technical features better initially when the voting started till about you know, almost entire part of the last century, the voting used to be carried out with the ballot paper. With change over to electronics, 
the voting is essentially became using EVMs and the EVMs comprises of three units control unit ballot unit voter verifiable paper audit trail CUBU VB pad and what happened there so on the left hand side when you see it is uh, and let me turn on my pointer so it will be better so left hand side this is the ballot paper which was till about 2000 it was a postal ballot paper or printed ballot paper then in 2000 2014 a major transition that took place and till 2014 the machines had cu and a bu in 2017 onward the machines actually brought in one more component called bb pad so cu bu and bb pad voting process in india is uh, approximately uh, uh, you know uh, now close to something about uh, 70 75 years long process so the ballot paper to ballot transformation or uh, electronic transformation the following thing happened so the ballot paper which was there it it got uh, converted into a ballot paper that is inserted in the machine so exactly identical so the ballot paper originally had serial number the serial numbers are still retained it had candidate name candidate names are retained and it had party symbol the party symbols are also retained in addition to this there is a small circuitry here which provides ballot buttons and the corresponding leds and also these engravings for uh, people with uh, visually impaired to be able to touch and figure out the numbers um, what was there as a seal in the ballot paper somebody would mark a seal got converted into pressing a ballot button and the corresponding led is lighted up so essentially ballot unit and the ballot paper are identical in terms of processes in terms of usability now when a voting takes place in the machines first step is when a voter approaches the presiding officer the presiding officer presses what is known as ballot button this is the ballot button it is on the cu or control unit control unit remains with the presiding officer by pressing this ballot button the ballot unit this particular unit which remains in an isolated place in a secluded place in a voter compartment that gets enabled in step two the voter presses one of the candidates button for his choice and the corresponding red light actually glows up in the led button and at the same time a beep is heard on cu which is actually for everybody to hear which says that the vote has been cast What was stored in the ballot box, you know, the boat which was stored in the ballot box now gets stored in the control unit in the electronic form and it remains with the presiding officer. So this is this is how the voting actually takes place. At the result stage, ballot boxes were opened, papers were mixed and counted, sorted and counted. In this place, the control unit has a button by which results can be counted and when the results are counted it displays the candidate number and the corresponding sum total of the votes which have been cast on this particular machine now evms are very complicated devices and i'll talk about this later but it required very specialized uh, research and design effort what election commission did they defined something known as technical experts committee from 2006 to 2009 professor pv indiration was chairman of this committee and he was a, uh, a director of uh, faculty member of IIT chennai and director of iit delhi professor dt shani and professor ak agarwala these three were the uh, technical expert committee in 2009 
technical experts committee was expanded because of certain criticisms that people talked about and because of that two of us that is myself and professor dinesh sharma who is the moderator today joined as member of the technical expert committee in 2009 in a sense iits and iit faculty in fact ashok talked about the design was done initially by iit bombay design team so iits and iit faculty are mentoring the evms and bb pad design and these are being manufactured by bel and ecil so teams at bel and ecil also being mentored by iit by this technical expert so this is a very interesting story i thought i should talk about last major election was lok sabha 2019 voting was carried out in seven phases over five weeks and it is interesting to know it in numbers because uh, these numbers are astonishing especially when we talk of various other countries these numbers become very very uh, surprising for many people because many times the population of those countries is probably much, not even 10% of uh, so called indian numbers counting was done on a single day on 23rd of may in 2019 there were about 90 crore voters 543 members of lok sabha which were to be elected a total of about 1 million or 10 lakh 35000 uh, polling stations were set up total about 4 million electronic voting machines were pressed in services and about 1.75 million voter verifiable paper audit trails were actually pressed into services 3.96 million when i say it is cu plus bu being counted as two not as one um, as per the procedures of election commission which were supplemented by decision of supreme court five bb pads per polling station were counted which came to 20625 bb pads they were manually counted and about 70% 69% voters exercised their voting rights now this is a huge huge numbering system and it is a you know it's a very big operation and that's the thing that i wanted to say so i only talked about eci is the central constitutional body to conduct elections and it is also the custodian of evm it is a very small body but during the elections it takes charge of the entire bureaucracy to conduct the election so this is a very interesting thing at that time it becomes supreme body um election process is voter appears at the polling station his finger is ink and as a proof of voting and the uh, this is done at the time of um, is validation or verification of the voter voter then presses a key on the polling station which is the voting so there are two separate processes one is voter identification or voter verification and the second one is actual voting and two are independent processes and this there is a reason for that and i'll just talk about this little while now votes are recorded in a control unit and control unit is then sealed and locked and kept in a secure custody and when there is secure custody i want to actually mention that this is a joint custody by election commission and representatives of political parties the representatives of political parties put their signatures on the seal and these are then verified that the seals are not broken there are three aspects of confidentiality in general in voting one is vote confidentiality which particular uh, a party has been receiving the vote of from which voter so vote is a confidential entity till the day of counting and on the day of counting vote becomes uh, public because it is to be counted the second aspect is voter confidentiality is who has voted can that be confidential or should that not be confidential in india voter confidentiality is not maintained because the finger of the voter is also ink but in some cases in certain kind of elections voter is also confidential and the third confidentiality is board voter, voter association confidentiality that is which board was cast by which voter and so on this in india remains confidential forever unless 
demanded by uh, legal framework. So CU, BU, and BBPET are three units in the election machines. Um, there are many other units which are used for very, very specific purposes. First unit is FLCU, which is first level check unit. Machines before they are pressed into service, they are tested, they are checked, and these checks are done using what is known as first level check unit. Um, there are potentially other units which can be also connected, independent code verification unit, symbol loading unit, totalizer unit. Many of these units are really not used in the current elections right now because election commission has to take a call on some of these things. But the fact is the machines have been designed to be able to handle this. Independent code verification units can verify the code, software code in the machines, a uh, symbol load unit, can is used to load the symbols which are to be printed on the uh, BB pack uh, graphical representation. The totalizer unit where multiple CUs can be connected and the total of all those CUs can be put during the county. There have been three versions of EVM. Uh, in general, it is thought that lifeline of electronics is taken as 15 years as a ballpark figure there are in fact several models which suggest semiconductor electronics age beyond 12 years so therefore 15 years is roughly the life that one takes for the electronic of course many times uh, they can go up to 20 years 25 years and so on and so forth but with the advent of technology evm designs are also modified to take advantage of the technology there were three major versions, M1, M2, and M3. Model M1 is completely phased out. It was first introduced in 1982. 1989 onward, the first election was carried out in Kerala. And then after that, it took some time for it to be adopted. M2 was introduced in 2006. And it is currently in use. But because the elections today are not major elections, Election Commission has um, kind of been discouraging use of M2 and is using M3. Uh, M2 will start phasing out by 15 year logic from 2021 next year or maybe year after that. M3 was introduced around 2014 to 19. 2014 election few places M3 was used. And it is also around the same time as the introduction of VVPAT uh, 2014 some bb pads were introduced 2019 elections all elections were actually held with the bb pad from 2017 onward no election is taking place without bb pad so evms are completely off the shelf system based there is no specific proprietary um, hardware or software in, i mean inside it it's a completely off the shelf uh, system it's a security in this is by design it is not an add-on and it provides an end-to-end -end security from voter till the vote at the time of counting no unknown component it doesn't use microsoft windows it doesn't use linux because they're too big operating system in fact it is not an operating system every piece of code is actually written by the manufacturers and therefore there's no os it's very simple effective implementation and it has been designed to keep voting free of errors in fact it is one of the largest make in india initiative because we just counted it is about uh, six million um, evm units have been actually created or have been actually made vvpad provides an alternate and manual way of counting as the voter votes the corresponding paper slip is printed in the VV pad, but it is not handed over to the voter. He can only see it. After seven seconds of display, the slip is then cut and deposited in a box underneath, and that remains a sealed unit. On the day of counting, if VV pad are to be counted, they would be opened and counted. It provides an alternate method. Um, in 2019 elections, 20,625 BB pads were counted. About 100 million votes were therefore counted manually. And it is interesting to note there were a few mismatches, and we needed to do a root cause analysis for that. 
but not even a single unexplainable mismatch. Every mismatch was explainable. We had to do a little bit of work on that, but every uh, mismatch that came could be explained. Large number of them were one boat or so. Um, and we, I can talk about it later when I talk about VVPAT in more details. Uh, now, Indian EVMs have certain unique features, and they're very different from various EVMs in the world. The very purpose of introduction is different in India. Indian EVMs were introduced to stop the malpractices of the manual voting. Whereas in other cases, in other places, EVMs are introduced to simplify the operations and from the logistic purposes, not so much for the malpractices. In fact, one of the features that two voters have to be at least 15 seconds apart is a very unique feature of Indian EVM. It is not there in anywhere else. Indian EVMs are also unique because of the design contribution that comes from multiple people. The users, the Election Commission of India, is as keenly involved in the design of Indian EVMs as us and the manufacturers. There is an independent technical experts committee, five of us, and who actually are not reporting to Indian Election Commission of India. In fact, we don't take any money. It's a voluntary service. And therefore, we actually have complete independence. We can actually, if we don't like, the process being adopted by election commission of india we could actually say no we don't like it it's a non-commercial manufacturing units in strategic sectors vl and ecil who manufacture these evm and they are uh, psus public sector units for defense and atomic energy respectively it has evolved through experience in harsh conditions and huge and varied electorate background Dedicated system for voting. It is not a general purpose system. It is not a general purpose controller. There is no internet, nothing. And therefore, Indian EVMs are extremely, extremely different from most other EVMs. Um, so, this was the introduction. Let me talk about what kind of security processes are in place. And then I'll talk about what people think and what people raise as doubts and why they are not good enough doubts and these kind of things. So, from a design perspective, it's a standalone machine. It doesn't even connect to the power outlet. It works on the battery. So one cannot even say that through power lines, I can actually blow this machine away. No radio frequency transmission or reception. There's no antenna, no wireless communication possible. In fact, the machines go through a security test at the time of manufacturing to actually establish that there is no wireless antenna available and they actually go through proper emi uh, emc test for finding out such kind of things the machines carry processors and the processors use one-time programmable chip the software burnt on the e chip cannot be rewritten modified or erased even by the manufacturers of the chip or of the evm session keys it uses uh, for communication for every voter dynamic keys and every time a button is pressed that dynamic coding is used and therefore anybody who is reading or sitting on this wire will also not be able to figure out it uses a real time clock time stamping of every button that is pressed is carried out locks all the buttons press any time any all times the Manufacturing itself is a secure development. It is done by BEL and CIL. They actually have, uh, as I said, in house software developed and a secure manufacturing unit, which is actually verified by technical expert committee as well as the election commission. The logs which are generated in terms of manufacturing can actually say whosoever person touched this particular machine during manufacturing you know even that log is available and therefore these logs actually become part of the system to actually say that the machines were not touched by anybody else and these are automatic logs so as machines go on they actually are recorded then in addition to this there is a third party testing of random sampling base 
uh, we use STQC. STQC is yet another government organization. It's an organization in the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. And they carry out random testing as well the uh, secure manufacturing processes and sampling test. So all the machines have been designed for uh, six, uh, three sigma model and I will talk about that also. There are administrative safeguards. The machines which are actually uh, stored, they go through various different methods. First is allocation and secure movement of the machine. Machine which actually are going to take place for example, in Bihar will come from several other country places in the country and they will be allocated randomly and moved. Then there is a first level checking that is carried out to look at if there is any machine failure or anything. So third operation will be when the candidate slate is known, the candidate setting takes place when the, uh, when the uh, ballot paper is inserted in the machine and uh, VV pads are programmed with the graphical displays, graphical uh, images. Then randomization takes place, which says which particular machine will go into which particular polling booth. And mock poll, both at the time of FLC, at the time of candidate setting, and on the day of poll is carried out. It's a mandatory mock poll on every voting machine on the day of polling for at least 50 votes and this particular election it was changed to 80 votes also. Finally, poll closure, sealing and transportation, secure transportation, storage in um, you know fully guarded store rooms and security all around, and finally counting day protocol. So these are administrative procedures and administrative safeguards. Um, in every step, there is a stakeholder participation, opening and sealing of machines, political parties are invited when the EVM warehouses are opened and strong rooms are opened and machines are taken out. First level check and candidate setting, political party representatives and candidate representatives are involved. List of EVMs after first and second randomization is shared by the political parties and the candidate. Paper seals are signed on EVM by all uh, uh, political party represented and at, after every process and they remain these are temper evident paper seals if the machine is opened after sealing it will actually show that it has been tempered it then finally conduct of mock poll and receive of mock poll results and verification is also carried out along with all stakeholders first level check is basically uh, to check whether the machines are operational or not it actually machines are open they are cleaned up dust and all that is removed uh, then full functionality test is carried out behavioral check is done defective or non-functional evms are kept aside and some plastic breakage and all that if there are plastic parts like switches and all that which have to be replaced those replacements take place so serviceable items if they are broken they are service and non-serviceable items are actually clean and all that um, the entire process is then recorded in evm management system ems and a mock poll is carried out with a dummy ballot paper inserted and it is verified on the candidate setting day the ballot paper is printed and inserted in the ballot unit and the number of candidates that are going to be taking part that is set Ballot unit is sealed, mock poll is carried out for every EVM and 5% of the EVMs do full polling of 1000 votes. It is done after finalization of the name of the contesting candidates and it is done in the presence of the candidate or their agents. At this point in time, VVPAD symbols are also loaded. Then randomization takes place and the second level of randomization says which particular machine will go into which particular polling booth there are two levels first uh, randomization is prior to flc and the second one after candidate setting on the poll day mock poll takes place before start of actual poll about half an hour before mock poll with at least 50 votes in presence of candidates and their polling agents and this data is then erased after counting and verification 
and on this mock poll certificates signatures are put by every representative of the political party and and the polling booth officials okay i will very quickly talk about various debates having said this uh, various debates that actually have gone around people have said that the machines can be hacked people have said that votes can be stuffed after poll has been closed people have said that they can actually do remotely altering their control unit display or they can even do a memory manipulation remotely when the machines are in the uh, in the control room people have said that they can replace the microcontroller or memory chips people have said that they can alter the software and people have said nobody when nothing of this works then people come to this final argument saying nowhere in the world evms are so much in use why are we using it in india so international comparisons and these are i mean having said this i'll just very quickly go through each of these and say why these are not possible evms cannot be hacked because hacking basically means unauthorized access or control of the software over computer network for some illicit purpose in the case of evm the word hacking is not even applicable because they are stand alone machines they cannot be connected to network either through wire or wirelessly there is absolutely no network connectivity and the software is otp it cannot be modified once programmed so therefore evms cannot be hacked okay it no possibility of remotely altering cu display once again because there is no wireless communication possibility there is no network no wireless communication evm have no antenna so it is like saying i have a calculator on that calculator you know i can remotely modify the sum since that is calculator does not have any uh, wireless communication it is not a possibility so is the case in case of evm memory manipulation ruled out why because it memory is inbuilt in the cpu number 1 data is preserved using encryption and integrity codes at the time of poll close and if memory is manipulated if somebody gets hold of this memory and can manipulate he will not be able to uh, undo the encryption he will not be able to change the integrity codes and therefore it will be caught right at at that power on time itself and full and free access to cus after polling is over is ruled out because it is in the uh, strong room in the full custody of security and political party representatives are also invited as part of that security so breaking the seal and lock on the strong room again is not possible because these will be immediately uh, you know first we have to break the seals on the strong room then break the seals on the machines and these kind of things will be immediately evident because signatures cannot be done again for all the political party representatives okay replacement of microcontroller or memory chip or board before poll or counting is impossible because software on the bu and cu is checked for integrity at power on time bu and cus communicate only amongst themselves i mean they cannot communicate with so an authentic bu can only communicate with authentic cu and vice versa uh, they cannot communicate with non authentic uh, a non look alike of a cu cannot be connected to bu because it just not will work a modified evm component with microcontroller or memory cannot be usable because it will not be able to pass through the integrity test and it will not be able to prove its authenticity at the time of genuine unit because it is really not a genuine unit tempered source code like trojan or at the time of uh, uh, programmer being uh, programmer putting the code at the time of design is also ruled out because uh, what number of reasons number 1 it will require a programming of chip again it will require the chip manufacturers uh, during fusing of the software to be uh, party it will re reprogramming is not possible and the original software which is actually loaded in the manufacturing unit that code tampering is also not possible because code integrity check is also carried out and the code integrity check actually refers to the same binary which was actually done at the time of compilation 
after the closure of the loop pole evm essentially as soon as the pole close button is done evm will ignore every other button except uh, ball so ballot button is ignored therefore no vote can be carried inserted evm does not accept anything and poll closer time will not match with the evm and po diary because poll i mean every vote is time stamped and therefore the time that is actually put with the vote will show that the it is inserted after evm uh, was closed and the po diary actually carries at what time the poll started what time the poll closed so therefore this will be not a possibility okay i will now uh, make a break for uh, uh, some time and take questions the second half i will focus on the actual technology part of it so over to professor dinesh sharma yeah so uh, rajat there are two questions on the q and a uh, panel here uh, one is from uh, jay gupta uh, asking which other major countries use evms for elections and how do those evms differ from india you partially answered it but this is the question so several countries actually use evms notably america actually uses evm in america uh, we have to understand a few things in america unlike india where central elections are by defined by central election commission of india in america elections are defined by each state what technology to use what mechanism to use is actually defined by each state 27 out of 50 states actually use evms and 23 use other alternate methods uh, that venezuela estonia these are smaller countries which actually use evm uh, for their elections and our own neighbors like uh, bhutan and nepal and uh, kenya and such places actually use evm which are actually indian evms they have been uh, uh, provided the indian evms in collaboration uh, you know the corresponding election commissions actually uh, asked for india to provide those evms and indian evms were provided to them for elections so there are several others who actually use um, and various other people have actually tried at various different ways uh, at in the past like for example germany tried france tried and one of the uh, thing that i have actually not said is international comparison where people say such countries actually do not use evm we have to understand the law it is not the technology that can be used just like that it is the law that should be enabled in 1982 when evms were invented in india they could not be used for a long time till parliament passed a law saying evms would be a mechanism to be used in fact indeed uh, supreme court actually uh, gave a stay on use of evm because it was not part of the law and only after the law was enabled in india evms could be used so i hope i have answered there are many other countries which use it though there's a question from gautam barua saying why are totalizing units not used widely in the country counting on a per evm basis exposes voters to violence from opposition uh i think gautam this is the question that even we in the technical experts committee have why can't we use uh, totalizer and the totalizer has been demonstrated number of time for two reasons uh, that it should be used number one it actually connects to 16 um, evm and therefore it actually randomizes the summation you know it basically you can't really get uh, the voting trends of a particular polling station you get it for 16 polling stations and therefore um, some kind of uh, you know wrong practices that often candidates used to have and ignore the particular polling booth saying you did not vote that is that could be avoided and the second thing is of course it will make the counting much much faster you know uh, because you need to actually only uh, records 1 by 16 number of polling machines okay but 
law as of today does not permit and uh, the mechanism to do this is a wider stakeholder uh, consultation the political parties have not yet agreed to introduce a uh, totalizer unit into the county yeah so um, if i may add uh, one of the problems with totalizers is that if people are skeptical about evms they can be skeptical about totalizers they may say okay your evms are foolproof but your totalizers are reporting the wrong values so unless it uh, totalizers already exist by the way uh, technically there is no problem uh, the only problem is uh, that people might be skeptical about the results as declared by totalizer one other question uh, rajat uh, about voter identification so uh, uh, another uh, meaning uh, are there uh, number of voters the number of votes cast uh, from that particular constituency is this still manually tallied can this also be automated so in short voter identification and vote counting automation and another question which you can take maybe very quickly how they rank candidate on evm like who will be number 1 number 2 number 3 okay i think i will actually uh, answer both of these questions uh, first is uh, that uh, voter identification voter authentication and uh, voter uh, uh, you know uh, automation of that and telling of uh, the counts and all that telling of counts of course is carried out but more importantly these two are independent processes they are not connected at all because they are not connected it actually provides a secrecy or confidentiality of vote voter association okay the only way the association could be made is by time stamp and the time stamps in the authentication system is manually put and the time stamp on the uh, voting system is um, put by the machine so therefore it is uh, really speaking it is not a um, exact identification or exact uh, confidentiality break the second part is how is the um, ballot paper order um, of candidates determined the order is actually determined by a process which is actually approved by all stakeholders and that process is the following first there are um, national election uh, parties national parties and then regional parties uh, who are actually put that way and in the national parties the candidates are alphabetically sorted and similarly in the regional parties candidates are alphabetically sorted and all um, you know independents and all that are uh, sorted alphabetically so in fact this has been one of the reason why every political party wants to hire or wants to uh, put can candidates with uh, names starting from a or b so that uh, uh, they kind of come um, early in the slate but they are essentially all sorted by alphabetical order and this is a approved procedure by uh, political parties and election commission so rajat if you have the time there are a couple of serious questions that i have also answered in my presentation one is the perennial question that uh, how do you ensure that there is no sequence detector and that there can be malafide software inside the evm which will detect the sequence and then bias the count so i did talk about this in a little while i mean every key that is pressed is logged okay now if every key pressed that is logged and there is a sequence that for example so in in uh, theorem proving we say prove by contradiction so assuming that there is such a sequence existing okay and therefore this sequence would be recorded in the um, i mean any times is press all key locks are there so therefore it will be recorded and more importantly if this kind of a sequence exist and i think i'll first talk about uh, you know this in terms of bureau simple bureaucratic answer since machines cannot be communicated from outside that means 
a person who is going to press the sequences will have to go to the polling station and in order to really change the result at least 50% of the polling stations have to be tempered in this way so in a constituency with about 1000 polling stations one would assume that there are 500 people who are aware of this particular technology per polling party and since every election the polling parties keep changing that means if there are four or five dominant polling parties every each of these four and five dominant polling parties would have these 500 people in every district okay so and if we are talking of 700 districts is we are talking of 2000 people every district and so on so forth like several lakhs of people who actually know what sequence to be pressed and in india keeping a secret which is for 10000 people known for 1 lakh people or 2 lakh people keeping that secret is virtually impossible especially when political party people keep changing their political parties so it is virtually not a possibility just by that simple logic itself uh, Rajat, uh, there are lots of questions. I don't know how much time you have uh, to resume the second part, uh, but to pick a couple of those uh, which are uh, which can be answered quickly. One is uh, why is there a 15 second gap between two votes? And the other, more important, is that what were those discrepancies that you talked about between BB Pat and? I will be talking about. I will be talking about those discrepancies in my second half. Second half. So one question is, if voter and vote connection is confidential, how come political parties get information about what percentage of a group voted for which candidate? Oh, they do their own, uh, uh, you know, uh, study on that, their own statistical analysis, their own this surveys. This information is not from the EVM. This is not from the EVM. The best information that they can get from the EVM is that from this poll, this particular polling booth, how many people voted? And then often they connect that saying in this particular polling booth, 50% of these were of this category and 50% were this category, and that's how they extrapolate. So uh, some questions which can be just directly answered. How does the VU communicate with the CU? Is there a hardwire connection? The answer is yes. In fact, I have that in my next slide when I'm going to okay. talk about the technical part. Okay. So just one last question before you resume. Uh, Gautam Barua says, how about using money and muscle power to coerce party representatives to allow tampering after sealing, replace an EVM with another one and force the reps to sign on the seal of the new EVMs? Can EVMs be switched before it is sealed by opposition parties? The polling officer is also involved. Um, the answer is, you know, when there are multiple people involved, buying everybody is harder. And of course, in theory, if everybody is bought, including the security guards who are actually keeping it in the uh, strong room vigil, and the people who are actually uh, having their seals on the strong room, if everybody is bought, then, you know, the democracy doesn't exist. No, no, Gautam, uh, Rajat, even then, VB Pack will catch them. And the machine will be found to be replaced when it shows up for counting. That's right. So, so I mean, so this is like about work. hundreds of people have to be bought over to actually say that we will actually go no, under. No, right I'm saying even if hundreds of people are uh, bought over, the machine, when it shows up for counting, is checked that it is the right machine and the wrong. No, no, what I'm saying is even at even at counting time, those people who are responsible for looking at it, they can be bought over. So hundreds of, several hundreds of people have to be bought over. Huh. Yeah, because the, uh, because the candidates themselves are there at the time of counting. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So I think can we I... have taken major questions. Okay. I will resume with my presentation, which is slightly more technical. Um, and it is actually going to talk about what is in the EVM? So first, I'll talk about CU and BU. So CU has, the, uh, CU has four buttons, actually five buttons, and these are at different levels. And in order, level one buttons are always exposed, ballot and total. 
level two buttons are sealed. So CU and BU basically has five operational buttons. And I have actually said level one, level two, level three, level four. Essentially, level four buttons can be accessed only after level three button seal has been broken. Level three button seals and level three buttons can be accessed only after level two seals have been exposed. I mean, have been broken. And level two seals can be, I mean, that is the first seal. Ballot in total at level one, they remain unsealed. They are always accessible. Ballot button is pressed by the PO to activate the BU and enable the voter to cast his vote. And the total key is used to find the number of total vote cast because that's how they keep giving these uh, indications saying how much percentage of voting has taken place. At level two, at the end of the polling, this ballot button is, uh, this particular button, close button is pressed. And once this button is pressed, after that, the ballot button gets ignored by the software. So it is to actually close the polling and at the end of the polling, it is done. Uh, at level three is the result and printing. These are only can be accessed after the close button has been pressed, which, other, which means the close seal has been broken. And these will be done only on the time, at the time of counting. At the time of counting, by pressing the result button, it will show the results. And one can even print using a what is known as printer unit, which can be connected. Um, buttons remain sealed till the time of counting. And finally, clear button is the level four button, which is accessible only after result has been seen. In other words, result button has been pressed. And after that, uh, the previous data can be cleared. It is, and that's the time when every button essentially get uh, unsealed. And this is typically done at the time of FLC for clearing the votes. Now, CU has multiple states. It can be in a normal state, or it can be in result state, or it can be in closed state. In the normal state, ballot button is enabled, voting takes place. When a close key is pressed, it goes into closed state. And from closed state, it can go into the result state when a result key is pressed. And from result state to normal state when the clear key is pressed. In addition to this, there are two more states. In case there is a hardware error, for example, memory fails. And this, as I said, memory actually has an integrity code and all that. If the memory failure occurs in any of the state, it becomes non-operational state. So it goes non-operational. It is actually a faulty hardware. It has to be replaced. Alternately, there is yet another state called factory mode state. Factory mode state is when the machine has been opened and it's an unauthorized access. Okay. For unauthorized access, if the machine has been opened, it goes into factory mode. And from that factory mode, it has to go into the normal mode only after full factory tests are carried out. Full factory checks are carried out. And then only it can go into the normal mode. So these are the CU states. On the other hand, balloting unit, each balloting unit has 16 candidate keys and you can actually daisy chain one after another. Up to 24 balloting units can be connected in a, in a chain and which can actually allow up to 384 candidates, including one for NOTA. So, each valid unit has 16 candidate keys and corresponding LED lamps. The communication between, as somebody asked this, communication between CU and BU is basically through interconnected uh, cable. And these cables are essentially broadcast bus, only one master and multiple, C, multiple slaves. The master would typically be CU in the normal mode. So each unit has an address for identification because the broadcast bus, CU initiates a command to the address unit, BU1 to BU24 or to VVPAD. And the unit responds to that command. So it is like a command response kind of uh, communication. CU repeatedly sends out commands. 
looks at the response and based on the response carried out other work it is actually industry standard rs485 signals and differential drivers are used for long distance communication it can be up to 1000 meter 1000 feet 300 meter communication cable length however in uh, voting machines we use only 5 meter cable as a standard cable and the cable remains in the full display the third component is VVPAT or voter verifiable paper audit trail. In this VVPAT, uh, it's an independent system which is attached with the electronic voting machine and it allows the voter to verify that the votes are actually cast as intended. So voter press some particular button and only that particular slip is printed. So voter can verify that. And when a vote is cast, the electoral will be able to view that for seven seconds through a viewing window, the printed ballot slip contains serial number, name in multiple languages, and symbol of the candidate of his choice. This is only visible through VVPAD window. It cannot be taken out, and it gets cut automatically and falls in the sealed drop box of the VVPAD. Only after the VVPAD operation is complete, that means the printing is done and the uh, uh, BB pad slip has fallen into the sealed box, then only it is recorded in the electronics in the CU. In fact, we set upon ourselves certain specifications. The life of printed BB pad slip is five years. So it is not to be confused with the, uh, with the point of sale device receipts or the parking sales receipts and all that, which probably after about a month or so fade away. The VVPAD printed slip actually will remain the same, will remain readable for five years. And in fact, we have done these experiments about five years back. We actually, some test slips we kept with us and we later verified five years later that they were indeed verifiable. They were indeed readable. And since June 2017, every election is being conducted with VVPAD in loop. So this is how the VVPAD looks like. This is the viewing window. On the viewing window, one sees the symbol and sees this uh, serial number and sees the candidate name in multiple languages, some places two, some places three. It allows the voters to verify that the vote is as cast. As, as the button was pressed. And this is the way the machines are configured. In the voting compartment, BU and VVPAD will be kept, and with the presiding officer, CU will be kept. Now, what happens if VVPAD fails? You know, during polling, voter is alone in the BU VVPAD enclosure, and the VVPAD printer fails. I mean, this can happen because of mechanical device. Now, will the non-technical voter who is actually gone to cast his vote be able to understand what is happening? Will he be able to correct the fault? The answer is no. Will a voter be allowed to open the VVPAD printer during poll because it is in the voter compartment where only voters are allowed? If there is any problem, voter is not allowed to open the VVPAD printer. He cannot be allowed and therefore this cannot be corrected. And can any fault in the printer be always repaired on the spot in the field? The answer is, unless we have the technical people all over, it is not possibility and we just can't have a million technical people solving the VVPAD problem. So therefore, these things are not possibilities and therefore for a smooth functioning of the poll, VVPAD is not to be operated upon, VVPAD is not to be repaired and therefore, this is the mode that we have gone. Board verifiability will fail if the VVPAD fail because the main purpose of the VVPAD will be compromised. So this was the thing and therefore we actually introduced certain things in our designs for handling this. Printers are electromechanical devices. They are known to be failure and if a parking ticket printer fails, that's still okay. You know, the operator can open, correct it, move the, uh, move the paper roll or do whatever and then again print it here this is not a possibility and most common failures of any printing devices are paper jam 
paper since it actually moves on the roller it slips it does not move uniformly it has a poor contrast because the printer is not good and therefore print quality is bad and if a printer fails during pulling and not corrected number of things will happen a poor print in vv pad is ineligible board vv pad being uh, printers will fail and we have to achieve zero error and this was the problem problem that we put on ourselves on how do we do this main function of vv pad still remains that of a printer so we brought in sensors we brought in lot of sensors to look at zero error performance and all these things had to be miniaturized so that it actually fits into commercial compact thermal printers so there are size issues this has to be uh, you know very little or no margin of fitting sensors in those commercial printers and it also has to be cost effective so we did some of these very interesting things so what happens if voter verification is lost because paper is stuck or slipped it will actually show distorted symbols or name this itself could be a controversial thing because by distorted names or distorted symbols people will say that he probably uh, you know did not uh, see the uh, board correctly and all that and it board has gone for somebody else poor print contrast it cannot be read it is not visible it is not visible to the voter it is also not visible to the counting side paper was not cut and if paper is not cut and the next voter box in it will be lost of secrecy because he will know to whom the previous voter has voted and therefore these are the three things that we actually try to solve a solution was to create customized calibrated sensors to ensure that every slip that is printed is of good quality and to ensure that every vote is cut and deposited and vv pad will report a failure in a proactive manner to the presiding officer who will then replace the vv pad and voter will be allowed to cast vote again because the board has not been recorded in the machine technically it is all possible and lot of things have been done and it makes vv pad to be a non um, you know it's like a very uh, you know non trivial design it's very complex design and i'll talk about some of these things so on the paper on the back side we actually have these lines printed these lines are pre printed lines which are then scanned by a sensor to find out the movement of the paper every voter slip is exactly 99 mm and it has to be 99 mm it is actually verified at the time of printing then there are things like uh, on the voter slip there is a key there is a candidate name and the party symbol which is printed and there is a contrast sensor quality sensing that is also printed to find out whether printing has happened correctly or not on top there are these information which are printed which says uh, serial number of the vv pad on which it was printed and how many session you know every time a machine is turned on and off the session increments by one so therefore machine is not to be turned off during the voting and uh, if that happens the session number will change and it can be verified uh, so these are the black marks which actually can be used for automated numbering or automated counting also however the counting was actually right now carried out through manual processes only these are essentially like omr coding a binary coding so it gives a very high contrast print lasts up to 5 years in case of election petitions which can actually take as much as 5 years it is distortion free votes no symbol will ever get distorted no name will get distorted nothing will get distorted no paper jam slips because of these continuous monitoring of these lines and it keeps track of battery condition it's a embedded battery it keeps track of how much battery is remaining and that's why it is called 
paper audit trail PAT, VBPAT, voter verifiable and paper audit trail. Uh, so print on each VBPAT slip, it lasts for more than five years. Contrast of print for easy viewing, verified, it has to be more than minimum label, which has been determined at the time of printing. Slippers in printing, detected if it is 250 micron or more slippers that ever happens, it would be detected and it would be declared as failure. Slip must fall after printing and therefore fall failures are also detected. Okay, if the, uh, after uh, the voting is done, printing is done, if the slip does not fall at the bottom thing, then it would be declared that there is a failure. Now, votes are electronically recorded in CU only if there is no print effect. And VVPAT reports failure to the presiding officer. So now, where can the mismatch happen? Now, mismatch can happen, for example, these are all fibrous material, right? It's a paper. The uh, cut hardware, cutting hardware of the printer cuts it, but maybe one thread actually kind of holds it. Very tiny thread which kind of holds it. BB pad would be declared faulty. The BB pad would be sealed and new BB pad will be put. The recording, the vote will continue and the voters vote is not recorded in the control unit. However, during the transport and it is moved, this dangling paper by a single thread might actually now fall because the thread is not able to hold the weight of the paper. And therefore, in VBPAT, we will have one extra board. And in the, in the CU, there will not be one extra one board there. So there can be a discrepancy, which is a known discrepancy. There can also be a discrepancy, for example, when the paper is actually not cut and at the time of opening the BB pad, the counting officer sees that the paper is dangling and he removes that paper. Even in spite of all the instructions given to the counting officers, this may still happen. So there can be one board difference. There can be, uh, so these are the kind of things that, for example, can cause discrepancies between the BB pad and uh, actual counting, electronic counting. And it has been, actually said that in case of such discrepancies, the control unit count should be taken into account, not the VBPAT count. And if in a place two VBPATs were uh, put in service uh, because one faulted and the second one also faulted and both of them have a one board difference, there can be two board differences also. So, we have gone for essentially a zero error by design. There is a length sensor which looks at the printer integrity. Again, every board slip or a jam, length slippage accuracies are guaranteed to be better than 250 micron. It detects distortion in candidate name and party symbol anywhere. If there is a distortion, it will know that the, because we know for party symbol this much length of the paper should move and the paper length is not that much moved that means the party symbol has been distorted so is the case in candidate and so on okay there is a second sensor which is a contrast sensor it is for prints quality the printed quality of printing contrast sensor is actually calibrated and it is calibrated against standards of blackness these are what is known as codec printing scales. These are standards um, which are available and white and black have been very accurately calibrated uh, for the printer and uh, uh, the codec and they match. And it is guaranteed that the contrast will be good because if the contrast is not good, the contrast sensor will raise an error and it will uh, uh, be declared as a faulty VV pad. Printed slips will last, guaranteed to last for five years of election petition. Uh, false sensor, as I talked about, 
detects the failure of the slip cutting after both is printed. Um, depletion sensor to, de to detect whether the paper is depleting because the BV pad cannot be opened and therefore it must detect the paper depletion of the paper and after it has detected that maybe about 20 30 voters can still vote but in the meanwhile new vv pad has to be uh, arranged and the vv pad has to be replaced by the polling officials so this is for deplete sensor in addition zero error performance requires operating conditions environmental conditions in india we can actually have a dry heat temperature ranging up to 55 degree centigrade dry cold up to 5 degree centigrade humid heat up to 55 and humidity up to 90 rh and these designs of the printers designs of the vv pad have been done to be able to sustain these parameters these are much better than commercial parameters or even uh, certain cases mill grade parameters uh, they kind of come between mill grade and space grade in certain ways. Uh, while manufacturing, we created calibration jigs which are automated and they guarantee uh, statistically uh, four sigma production quality, um, with, which basically means during the production, none of these sensors will have more than 3% failure with 99.5% confidence level. Uh, so three sigma is guaranteed. If four sigma is guaranteed for each component, three sigma is also guaranteed for the manufactured item. The VV pad is guaranteed to be three sigma, which basically leads to zero error performance. These are some of the bases for zero error performance. Uh, in the EVM, we also implemented cryptography. Cryptography in a major way. But before I get into the cryptography, let me talk about a little bit of cryptography. Uh, so cryptography, uh, we use asymmetric key cryptography or public key cryptography. In public key cryptography, let's say if there is a sender and there is a receiver. The encryption basically means that receiver generates his public and private key they actually are in pair which are related private key is retained by the receiver it is not known to anybody else and public key is stored into what is known as key storage okay it is known to the world in some way so therefore sender knows the public key of the receiver sender generates a message p which is encrypted using public key and this corresponding decryption algorithm will work with the private key and not with the public key and therefore only the receiver will be able to see that so any sender can send the message but only receiver will be able to see that and assuming that there are people sitting on the wire looking at crypto analysis attacking trying to figure out the text or trying to figure out the private key because these are the only two secrets it has been shown what kind of algorithm should be used what kind of computational complexity should be there so that it does not happen we use public key cryptography system in fact in this particular case we use 2048 bit keys for rsa each component of the evm is a key pair has a key pair so now sender and receiver for us are each component each unit of the evm both CU, BU, VVPAT, everything else. In fact, approximately 6 million certificates keys, the public keys are actually kept with the certificate and uh, certificates are generated for the public key by the manufacturers. But even the manufacturers don't have any access to the private key because private keys are actually generated by the units themselves. They are never brought out. Uh, so, the manufacturers have generated 6 million certificates as of today, which is the largest implementation in the world anywhere, including financial domain, including authentication domain, including HTTPS, secure socket layer. Uh, you know, any place that you look at, 6 million certificates 
is a very large number no other implementation of public key in the world has taken place with 6 million public private key pairs now this is a, a matter of pride for us and this is a very big thing key generation is carried out by uh, units nowhere in the world key generation is carried out by people you know most of the time when you use digital signatures and all that your ca generates the public and private keys and gives you both uh, rarely you will find the holder generating his own private key this particular key public key pair is used for authenticating and for establishment of the session keys so let me first talk about the authentication so let's say there is a unit a and unit b so the first thing is a and b will exchange their certificates certificates are actually issued by the manufacturers a manufacturer's public keys are available to both a and b at the time of programming itself it is there now b's public b certificate uh, will be verified by a and a certificate will be verified by b using the corresponding manufacturer's public key after the certificate is verified the public keys of you know, a will know the public key of b and b will know the public key of a and after that a sends a random number r encrypted with public key of b so it sends with public key encrypted it sends random number r it also sends i have included in the diagram the session key establishment so it actually sends a, a part of his session key called k a which is given by a similarly b does the reverse thing b decrypts this message and it can decrypt this message only when it has that corresponding private key it can decrypt this message alters the message in order to alter the message it must be able to have the decryption of the message and the alteration is the following it returns back the same number r and it also generates its own uh, random number called r prime and its own key material called kb entire message is then encrypted using public key of a a will be able to verify will be able to decrypt and these r and r prime are random numbers a will send the random number r prime in plain text to b because random number by itself does not have any uh, secrecy but the fact that it has been able to get this random number knows I mean, B will know that uh, uh, A has the corresponding private key. Now, using KA and KB, all subsequent communication take place with this session key. And the session key is established by XORing KA and KB. And for this, it uses symmetry key afterwards. Okay. So, how does it happen? At power on, all units first carry out their own self test because machines are not openable it's a very very strong self test algorithm it actually looks at the self test of every component of buzzer of display of keys and all that kind of things and after the self test the cu performs the discovery cycle it actually goes and figures out which all components are connected it sends a probe request to each component bu1 to bu24 bb pat and every other unit the address unit is responds with the certificate exchange to the cu cu and units authenticate each other and set up the session key as we just described and then after that all messages are carried out using the session key and session key is pairwise which basically means the session key to bu1 is different than session key of bu2 because in order to have this key generation both units are collaborating both units are contributing their random numbers any device that is connected later or removed will go out of sync because the corresponding session keys are lost and symmetric key has been changed and will not be functioned it is as i said it is the largest public key cryptography implementation uh, both ecil and bel had set up a ca during the manufacturing the units go through the certificate generation step and in this step 2048 bit rsa keys are generated 
and units then generate a certificate signing request and send it to the ca ca generates the certificate and provides it to the uh, unit and ca use hsm hsm in non duplication mode even the ca key is not available anywhere other than hsm and this as i said about 6 million certificates have been done okay um we are also thinking of next step which is a remote voting i thought i'll take if time permits uh, maybe i can take just 2 minutes on this and uh, the remote voting for people i mean i'll skip this particular uh, part of it but it is basically saying that whom do i mean there are a lot of migrant voters and nri and all that who can be allowed remote voting now remote voting there are two issues predefined versus non predefined booths predefined basically means that the hardware and software is standardized non predefined basically will mean that the hardware and software are not standardized which basically means the hardware may have different resolutions different things and in addition uh, there can be a malicious software which can render the modified ballot on the display so therefore the idea that we have gone is go for predefined polling booths and also pre assigned polling booth e voters will have to go to specific polling booth so that they are actually disconnected from the corresponding regular polling booth uh in our system there is a registration of remote voters therefore their names will be struck off from the regular polling booth temporarily and they will be allowed only for remote voting remote voter authentication which is with the remote voter electoral roll and remote voting where remote cu and remote bu will be taking place and remote bu will have a programmable uh, ballot the cu will actually provide the ballot to the bu and bu will therefore correspondingly have the display of the screen of the ballot uh, which is actually for the constituency for which the voter has come to vote vote counting is done on distributed ledgers and telling of counts is done at all levels on in terms of where it is authenticated how many people voted and how many went into the ledger and how many counted all these telling are done communication is very important and communication is being carried out on a dedicated communication channel on demand by the presiding officer the polling machines actually do not have a internet internet has to be connected in front of the polling booth official as a separate internet unit so this is the remote voting that we have thought of uh, i think i will probably skip just in the interest of time what kind of communication mechanisms that we are talking about and thank you it has been a pleasure for me to actually present this work which is a joint work of the technical experts group myself professor dinesh sharma professor dt shahani and professor uh, agarwala ak agarwala and also uh, uh, bel and ecil and not to miss the election commission officials who have always been together in the entire design of this entire thing thank you i will actually pass the stage back to professor dinesh yeah rajat uh, meanwhile of course very interesting questions uh, have been coming uh, there is one follow up question about that uh, sequence voting uh, one of the explanations was that uh, vb pat will catch it so the follow up question is that not all vb pats are counted uh, counted only a sample is counted so what happens that right. one would not know which vv pad will be counted which will not be counted exactly. and therefore one cannot plan out uh, saying that we will take this risk and in this vv pad uh, you know uh, something can happen and but there is, that there is a, that aside that aside the counts have to match yeah uh, there is an interesting question which will have an interesting answer it said could you have any opportunity to convince the political party rep nullifying their allegation and what was their reaction i think we actually had lot of uh, interactive sessions with the political parties so called doubt clearing sessions and all that at least we are convinced that they are convinced uh, 
<laughs> Whether they are convinced in public eye or not, that's a separate issue. But we definitely were convinced that they were convinced. And, uh, you know, there is a politics, there is a uh, different face in the public and a different face behind the public. And therefore, we cannot comment on what they say and are they, uh, you know, if no, uh, till today, no complaint has been actually no uh, significant complaint or no validatable complaint has been given by any political party to the election commission. No verifiable complaint could be given. And therefore, uh, we are convinced that they are convinced. Uh, one somewhat technical question. Uh, what happens if two keys are simultaneously pressed on the BU? Uh, the BU will actually be able to. So first of all, there is no simultaneous key, and the hardware is actually very very fast to catch in the order of milliseconds uh, which particular key is pressed. But if two keys are pressed, only the first key electronics is actually have a very high resolution to figure out which key is pressed first. The first key would be recorded. Second key will be ignored. And a question that if our EVM is so technically sound and tamper proof, then why doesn't US or Europe use EVMs for accuracy, speed, and reliability? I think this is the point that I actually said. I think when every other every other argument actually goes away, then this is the last argument that actually remains. And I think partly technical expert committee is to be blamed for this. We had put a complete embargo on export of these machines to outside till there is a proper procedure implemented. Now, why am I saying so? Because there is no such thing known as absolute security. It is basically a security that requires administrative procedures also. The very fact that Election Commission of India was always party to this design actually showed that uh, you know the security was not compromised. The administrative procedures were not compromised. Can we have the same thing outside the country? The answer may or may not be yes. Okay. And if the administrative procedures are broken and somebody steals the machine or some does something you know replaces all the hardware except the plastic and says i can actually temper it which is not called tempering but if does it then it will only bring bad name to indian hardware and the indian elections unless such kind of things are there it is not a possibility uh, about uh, last question is ca common to bel and ecil no they are different C B E L has a different C A C L. I mean, uh, E C I L has a different C A. But their uh, uh, both their root keys are available to all the hardwares. They have been exchanged uh, on paper through M O U S. So Rajat, thanks. This has been an exciting session. Uh, there are a few other questions, but we are running out of time. I'll pass it back to Madam Sushila Venkatraman now. Thank you very much. Uh, this, this has been indeed a very interesting session. You know, Rajat, you said that the first uh, uh, time the EVM was used was in 1982. Uh, the Assembly Constituency by-elections in North Parur. That is my hometown. So I remember wow. the <laughs> excitement we felt when it was first uh, announced. And you know, you've talked us today through what has happened and the long distance we've traveled since that first time in 1982. Uh, I think Professor Muna brought, brought out very clearly the complexity of the Indian electoral system, two different electorates, uh, difference in the electoral system itself, two types of EVM, their administrative procedure. So, it is a lot of complexity uh, that uh, we've been able to bring under our wings. Um, the, I, the, the, just a few points that I want to highlight. One of them was uh, how you've made this whole system. So the EVM is not just about the box. It's about the whole system, including the administration that goes behind it, the involvement of the people who are going to 
operationalize it and so on. And uh, one of the things you mentioned was visual, uh, that is suitable for visually, the visually impaired. So how has this whole system become inclusive uh, to make sure that every person who's eligible to vote can cast their vote? Uh, huge numbers, Lok Sabha 2019, nearly 4 million EVMs were pressed into action. So, you know, when we imagine the complexity, and you brought this out today very clearly, it's, it's not just about the technology, the technology requirements of something that the end user, the voter sees is just a box on which they press a key, but what goes behind it is just so much of complexity. The technology requirements of the various components of the system uh, many of which we don't even see, right? We, there are some that we feel and see, but there are many other things behind that. Also the administration of this whole system and the complexities uh, that, that are involved, issues of complex uh, confidentiality and what is and will uh, forever remain uh, confidential, it gives us a lot of, uh, uh, you know, comfort knowing that this system is indeed built and designed and built to be a foolproof system for a country like ours. Uh, he brought out the importance of stakeholder participation. We hear this time and time again, every time we talk about system design, system implementation, system building, we always say that all stakeholders must be involved. But today we've had a peep into how difficult it must have been to get all of these stakeholders uh, to agree on, on what is required of the system, manufacturers, the election commission, independent technical experts, as well as the political parties so that, that uh, would have taken a lot of doing, one can see that. The logging and tracking of every single unit to, uh, so that you know who has touched it, even through the manufacturing cycle, that, that again was something that came up. And, um, uh, the legal framework that is required to implement something like this. It's not enough to have the technology and the processes behind it, but also the legal framework to make sure that it does get implemented well. The administrative process is seem to be at once complex and simple. So it's, uh, you know, the simplification of something that is very complex to make sure that it's implementable and gets implemented really well. And uh, you, know, you really clearly explained uh, how it has been made fail safe, the cryptography, all the rest of it. Uh, so the, the team had set for itself clearly some very tough, tough specs and extremely high standards. And, uh, and the team has actually uh, met every single one of those. The range of technologies that have gone behind this, uh, the electronics, of course, and the software and all of that, the printing, the inks that are involved, the cryptography. So it, it's not the sensors. So it's not just about you know, a, a box, it's so much more uh, and so many technology components that have, been, uh, ha that have gone into this. Also the versions and therefore the evolution of this EVM system uh, as technology has changed and also the changing need of the electoral, uh, electoral, uh, electorate and the nation the unimaginable scale at which uh, all of this has happened. We've heard this time and again, we heard this at our uh, industry conclave in February as well, that problems that are solved for India can solve problems for the world. And you've proven this. You've proven that through this example, that if it can work in India with our complexities, our diversity, surely it can address global issues and this system uh, has been exported to many, many countries. And um, so I think we can all be justifiably proud. We had Dr. Koshi, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, ex-chairman of uh, Bharat Electronics on this webinar, and I'm sure he felt as proud of uh, what has been achieved as you, Professor Dinesh Sharma, and every one of us who's been on this, uh, listening into this webinar, every Indian can be absolutely justifiably proud of uh, what has been achieved through the EVM system. Uh, 
So I, I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, this was an extremely insightful uh, discussion uh, at, at many different levels. And uh, really, thank you very much for all of this. Uh, our audience, thank you for being here. I'm sorry we had so many questions, but we could not take all of them due to paucity of time. But I hope you know that the audience will have an opportunity to write in separately to you and, and get answers to the questions that they have. Thank you for being with us. Uh, this talk, like every other of our talks, is going to be put on to our uh, into the IIT ACB webinar uh, YouTube channel uh, by Monday. You should see it up and. Uh, Please do look forward and continue to attend our webinar series. Okay, so thank you very much once again uh, for taking this up, Professor Sharma, Professor Muna. Thank you for being here with us.